All right. So yeah. So she was asking about LIBOR. LIBOR is a floating rate. Please read up on it. And there's also a famous LIBOR scandal because it's fixed by the banks. Okay. The rate is actually fixed by the banks. So try and read up on the LIBOR scandal. Uh, it basically it's 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 not a traded price. Okay. It's an indicative price, and it was basically and the banks were rigging the price because they wanted to make money on their derivative transactions. A major scandal. One guy is still land. Someone UBS UBS and Citibank trader. Uh, he's uh, still in jail in London. So the UK has very strict penalties for these kind of white collar crime uh, offenses. So so read up on LIBOR and uh, I've given you that link and now so they've changed it to ICE LIBOR and there's also a new uh, floating rate benchmark that is coming up that is called SOFR secured overnight funding rate that's coming up in the US okay so that essentially the problem with LIBOR was that uh, people were fixing the rate so they were just how were they getting the LIBOR values they would just poll the banks in the morning at 11 a.m. 11 a.m. London time they would just poll the banks and say okay and what is the rate at which you are willing to lend to other banks in London at the, uh, today for say Swiss francs yen Aussie dollars US dollars euros sterling all these currencies they would ask them and everybody would would give their rates and they would knock out the top uh, top and bottom rates and then just give you an average and that would be your LIBOR but what was happening is because of this kind of uh, method of fixing some guys who want to make money on their derivative and this is LIBOR is actually the basis for this this thing that you see here I don't think they've switched yet to SOFA this euro dollar futures contract that you see here which is uh, GE I don't think we have that here but if we add that um, we should have uh, how did it disappear um, this is gold right yeah so that's this must be GE uh, if we uh, GE Globex euro dollar okay now this Globex euro dollar is basically the this is the reason why this is the reason why I've always told you that whenever your intention is to refer to the euro dollar FX rate you must always say euro dollar FX otherwise there could be confusion with this euro dollar interest rate contract it's one of the major interest rate contracts in the world it creates massive amounts of volume this contract settles against the three-month LIBOR fixing in London this is the futures contract and the underlying asset is the three-month LIBOR uh, deposit what is it whatever is the interest rate okay so they are huge they're like trillions of dollars of derivatives contracts against LIBOR and so every uh, so many people many of the traders had an interest in fixing LIBOR because they knew they, they could manipulate it, right so if I had say that okay I go through the broker and I say okay you please tell Shuk to quote this rate for sterling and in return I will quote this rate please tell Rajan to quote this rate for yen and in return I will also quote a lower rate when you need it so there was collusion among the the various banks because they were actually just taking the rate as okay what are you lending at, at today so they were just polling the banks and they manipulated the uh, input that they gave so this became a major scandal lots of uh, lawsuits may be still pending so this is so this contract the euro dollar contract which is a major contract this will settle on December 16th so we can keep this so you notice this is quoted as you can read up I've given you this is part of your case as well okay but this is not part of your trading project but this is part of your case all right so you should understand the euro dollar contract one of the most important contracts in the world okay later on if we have time we I mean I, I in a subsequent project because we don't have enough money uh, cap enough capital in this account to trade everything but I, ideally we would trade uh, this also we would also trade um, yeah we'll put this down okay so you notice how the euro dollar, let's discuss the euro dollar contract a little bit okay while we are on this topic of LIBOR okay so a little bit unplanned but uh, doesn't matter that's how it is that's how it should be okay we go based on questions okay so is everyone following the discussion okay why are we interested in LIBOR because we are in our case we have said that we see this uh, we see this loan here okay we see this US dollar loan here hundred thousand okay and when you read the case you see so on this loan there is no interest rate there is no foreign exchange risk because their revenues are in US dollars and the liabilities in US dollars but there is interest rate risk which we find out when we see this thing in the in the case what does it say it says that there are loans in yen Aussie and US okay uh, and then later on when we read the questions we find that the dollar loan has a five-year maturity and the interest rate is linked to three month LIBOR okay ice LIBOR is only because ice is ice is an exchange it used to be called the Inter intercontinental exchange but now if you just go to the ice.com okay this you'll get the link from here if you see here 
this is the ice.com this is the now they've just changed their name to ice a very big exchange okay not as big as cme group but one of the very big exchanges so they have the brent crude oil futures contract okay while cme has the wti futures contract on oil so ice is now fixed taking care of the libor fixing okay so they have introduced certain safeguards but they're taking care of the libor fixing so you can see here so the main point problem of libor so every day there will be a libor fixing for multiple currencies now they've reduced the number of currencies earlier there used to be many currencies now they've i think knocked out aussie and canada and all that okay so uh, but there are going to be understand the libor fixing is going to be for multiple currencies because just like when you look at hdfc bank fixed deposits in india it's not just one rate it's just it's three months one month 90 days 180 days whatever right so it's one year five year all kinds of maturities for in any currency whenever you're looking at interest rates you have to mention the maturity as well because otherwise it doesn't make any sense interest rate for what maturity okay so every uh, car so that means when you're fixing the when you're taking the LIBOR fixes you are going to go by currency and you're also going to go by maturity so you start with us dollars and you say okay give me the one month libor three month libor two month libor six month libor nine month libor are you following yeah. libor is nothing but the london interbank offer rate which is a it's a borrowing rate offer rate so it's not the bid there's also a lie bid which is the london interbank bid rate okay but less less used okay more commonly used is libor which is the late rate at which the banks will lend to other banks in london okay so every day because you can compute this rate every day every day you can see the fixed deposit rates of any bank in india right so and those days if you start the fixed deposit on that day if you start a three month fixed deposit on that day it'll be three months from that day then tomorrow you go open another fixed deposit it's three months from tomorrow okay so every day you have an interest rate and every interest rate per currency you have multiple maturities so when you do the libor fixings okay you can we can click this open and see whether ice has been blocked uh, so they haven't blocked ice okay all right so you can read about this you can see all their um, uh, you can see all their uh, markets you can go there's a scheme similar scheme to the CME website because they're a, a big exchange they're also the owners of the NYSE okay so you see that their information there as well you can see LBMA uh, gold and future uh, gold and silver data this is LBMA is London metal uh, London um, uh, bullion market association okay is LBMA okay so you can see here that uh, so you can see I you can read about ice LIBOR okay now they're doing it only for these currencies earlier they had Aussie and Canada and all that okay but now they've dropped all that so this is the idea here so you will be doing it for each currency and then you can see seven tenors are you following you can see here the articulation of what I just told you basic concept in every currency interest rate a statement about interest rates has no meaning unless you mention the maturity okay so here you can see the way the LIBOR is fixed now is five currencies and for each currency they're gonna go for all these seven tenors okay this is clear read up more about it read about the LIBOR scandal part of your learning okay all right so uh, so this is the problem here in this case if we go back to the interest rate so this actually leads us to our discussion of uh, the uh, key risk factors okay once again so because because the uh, the loan has a five-year maturity okay and it has an interest rate index to three month LIBOR it's a floating rate we call this a floating rate loan okay essentially a floating rate loan means that the maturity of a lot of the loan is longer than the uh, period for which the interest is being reset okay so if you go we can write this uh, I haven't written a definition of this we can write this somewhere in your notes okay so we for everything we need to have everybody understands what a floating rate loan is okay in India also SBI has uh, floated the idea I uh, have has toyed with the idea of they even came out with it I think now the regulators have banned it or something like that they came out with the floating rate housing loan scheme or something like that right they had these teaser interest rates also so we look at um, we can write it where do we write it under let's write it in your session outline okay so under um, 612 we can write 
so you notice that we are making you won't find this kind of a definition anywhere we are forcing a definition because everything has to be tightly defined like in mathematics okay or in physics so that you have the concept is very clear and you don't confuse it with anything else okay so how will we and it has to be an objective definition you see a lot of definitions which are used in law in finance which are not objective you've seen your great capital asset pricing model which is full of subjective exogenous variables okay and even the endogenous variable is subjective so cost of equity is also a subjective in the sense how would you know what the actual is right so you can't even actually evaluate that model because if you compare it to something like let's say um, if somebody is predicting next quarter's retail sales if you have a model in which the endogenous variable is next quarter's retail sales then with the passage of time you can get that actual data with the passage of time after six months or so you will have what the next quarter's retail sale was as time passes right that's objective data okay it'll come out of the retail sales federation or whatever are you following what i'm saying yes sir so if you're doing if you're building a model which has an endogenous variable like next quarter's retail sales one of the things you should notice is that yes this endogenous variable actually can be observed and it's objective like if I predict rainfall tomorrow's next day's rainfall in Delhi, that's also an objective uh, entity. We can get the data from the Met Office. So after six months, we can evaluate uh, what was the actual rainfall versus what was the prediction. So when you look at models, we have had this discussion before. Okay, we are just going into this uh, because uh, because I'm trying to give you a tight definition. Okay, so you'll see that finance is also replete with cases like this, like the capital asset pricing model, cost of equity when you are using it as an endogenous variable in this determination model. Do you realize it's not an objective entity? It's not an objective quantity? How will you see what the cost of equity actually was? How will you see what it, how it, how, what it actually was? So you predict something for some period, but then there's also the question of what was the actual? Like I predicted uh, $2 billion of retail sales for next quarter, but it turns out the next quarter actually it was one and a half billion. Okay, so you can say that your forecast was off by half a billion. At least you can say that. At least the model is such that the endogenous variable is objective and you can actually say that. You can measure the forecast error. Are you following what I'm saying? Whereas in, in, in the CAPM, you can't actually measure because how will you know what the cost of equity actually was for that period? When you get into that, again, you will have to get into uh, either you do a survey of various people, what did they use, but that is also not objective because your survey is not complete and different people have different views and you're averaging it. So it's a highly unsatisfactory method. So when you're looking at any model, you should ask these kind of questions. Is uh, Look at the exogenous and endogenous variables. Are they objective? Can you objectively get the data? Right? Are you following what I'm saying? So these kind of questions. So here we are trying to define it in a very tight and objective kind of way. Okay, so we are saying that a floating rate loan Floating rate loan is, um, I'm not writing it in full English sentences, loan tenor, okay, exceeds the period for which interest rate is, um, well again I was going to say periodically reset, okay, um, set and reset okay you see how this definition is very specific you can apply this to the situation okay this is being written in your notes so you have this you don't need to write it down it's in your own session outline notes okay right so what are we seeing in the five uh, five uh, five uh, year loan in the case of a five year loan and the interest rate is being reset on a three monthly basis three month LIBOR essentially means when you when you're looking at three month LIBOR not one month LIBOR or six month LIBOR it means it's an interest rate for three months okay so what will happen to this five year loan when you take the loan your uh, certainty with respect to interest outflow is only for three months because at the beginning of the period you set the rate just like when you invest in a fixed deposit you can see the rate today what you'll what are you what are you going to get for six months you can see that rate okay what are you going to get for three months and based on that you invest okay and the bank pays you the interest at the end of the period okay if it's not a very short term then if it's a very long term deposit you can take periodic interest payment and all that but uh, let's take a simple deposit of a three month the bank pays you the interest at the end similarly here you will set the interest rate at the beginning of the period and you will pay the interest at the back uh, the back end okay so this will be say pay, paid in arrears okay it's set in advance and paid in paid in arrears the interest which is normal
normal basic okay we're just using fancy language too. so are you able to follow this so anytime you have an interest rate which is basically being reset you know usually multiple times within the tenor of the loan so you have a five-year loan but the interest is set only at a time is being set only for i can probably improve this language a little bit loan tenor exceeds period for which interest rate is set uh, interest rate is set and reset but you get the idea that the loan tenor is bigger and the period for which the interest rate is being set at a at a, at a time okay is shorter than the loan tenor so that Im immediately introduces what we call floating interest rate risk because three month LIBOR can start really rising very rapidly. Okay. If you look at charts of three month LIBOR, you'll see if we can dig up some rates here, it will take us some time. Actually, we may get it in our uh, uh, friendly neighborhood charting system, which, cont which contains everything actually. Uh, let's see if they have three month LIBOR. No. Let's see. But we have euro yen six month LIBOR futures. Mm. Yeah, they have some long. Sh anyway, I, I I can't recognize any of these uh, except the euro yen. Okay, never mind. So the point is that basically LIBOR also moves around quite a bit. Okay, so we'll try to um, to try to give you. Let's say if I can find the um, where is the Fred Fred chart. <coughs> Yeah, so we have the Fred chart. The Fred is this is a very good chart for those of you who are interested in doing economic. There you get a lot of Indian data also on this. Okay, this is the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, so you can read their publications as well. These are all very reliable sources. So if we look at interest rates and we try to look at um, three months, I just want to give you a interest rate uh, LIBOR rates. Okay, let's look at LIBOR rates and uh, three month london interbank offer rate okay which is a libor okay let's see this is from 1986 yeah okay that's fine till 15 hours ago so let's do this so we are trying to understand what is meant by interest rate risk so maybe we are going a little bit slowly all right but at least you'll understand right okay so now you can see what's going on here okay this is only from 86 that's why it's not showing the the long cycles but anyway can you see this this is the movement of LIBOR okay so it's gone all the way from actually it was even higher than this it was about 18 percent and all I, I think in 1980 okay so uh, the point is it's coming down all the way from 18 percent or so in 1980 all the way down to almost zero okay this is where the central bank started cutting after the 2008 crisis you can see this sharp period of drops in interest rates the short-term interest rates okay uh, this is where you see the central banks cutting rates aggressively after the crisis hit after the financial crisis hit okay and then so this this thing is reflecting the Federal Reserve raising rates because this, this is a dollar LIBOR okay if you look at a yen LIBOR you'll get a different kind of picture okay because the yen LIBOR has not gone up at all this this rise in the LIBOR here reflects the the Federal Reserve has been raising rates ever since Trump came into office they uh, they have been raising rates quite aggressively I think they raised it eight times now they have cut a couple of times two or three times they have cut okay so that you cannot see here as well so whatever the Federal Reserve because LIBOR three month LIBOR is a pretty short term interest rate okay so it will closely track the central bank policy rate it won't be exactly identical because there's a difference between an, uh, a short term rate of overnight to 14 days, which the central bank is targeting. OK, whereas this is the three month rate, but there's not that much difference between a fortnight and three months. Right. So it will tend to closely track this. So you can see this rise of LIBOR now is reflecting the Federal Reserve's uh, raising of interest rates. You've been following that. The US Fed has been raising rates aggressively since Trump came to power. OK, so. Um, so this is what you see the point of this chart here is even though it's only from 1986 you can see that the LIBOR rate group moves around quite significantly okay so and usually loans are in very large amounts okay so that's why now this is what is meant by interest rate risk so if you're in this particular part you can see mostly it's coming down but there are still periods when say from here to here it did go up right so if you are caught in a situation where you take a floating rate loan here okay and then the rate starts moving up then you have a problem because your interest outflows are certainly uh, trying to uh, tending to increase a lot so you every every company has a budget so they have a budget for interest outflows also on loans right so this will throw everything out of gear 
because interest rates are rising rapidly short term interest rates are rising rapidly so you are your interest our liability is increasing quite quite a lot is this clear are you following what is meant by interest rate risk okay so this interest rate risk arises on the uh, uh, typically on the floating rate loans which is basically the way to think about floating rate loans is the period for which the loan is being interest rate is being set and reset uh, periodically is shorter than the tenor of the loan and that's what creates the risk if you have a three month loan on three month LIBOR there's no risk because you know at the beginning of the period what your interest liability is because the loan is only three months the risk really comes from the fact that if you have even a six month loan against three month LIBOR then again you have a problem because the three month to six month rate you don't know you don't know what it's going to be right so here you can see that after three months the interest rate amount would be the the rate at the last day of the three months. Yes. Yeah. So again, yeah. So against the three month, at the end of the three month period, at the end of the three month period, you will have another LIBOR setting, which will apply to the next three months. Another three month LIBOR setting because the loan has been documented as being against three month LIBOR. So they will look at the LIBOR setting at the end of the three month period. So it's only converted to other LIBOR. Which other LIBOR? Huh? I mean, uh, on the first three months, if we have taken the floating uh, interest rate. Yeah. So on the last 90th day, uh, on the 91st day, it will be converted to another floating interest rate for the next three months. It's yeah. not going to fix interest rate. No, 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 because it's a floating rate. But effectively, see, if you have a six month, let's assume this is three months, this is six months, this is nine months, this is 12 months. Okay, let's assume. So obviously, at the first, if you have a three month loan against three month LIBOR, there's no problem problem because the rate is set at the beginning and it applies at the end yes. and that's it there's no uncertainty the problem of risk is basically when there's uncertainty about the cash flow okay so here but if you have a six month loan you against three month LIBOR your three month LIBOR initial first three month period the rate is set at the beginning like this okay so this you pay at the end over here but again at the end here you reset the rate you will again look at the three month rate three month LIBOR rate for the next six months and uh, next three months so that rate you don't know when you're standing here that rate could have anything can happen in three months okay so that rate you know that's where the risk comes from okay is this clear a conceptual way to think about a floating rate loan definition of a floating rate loan all right so that brings us to the uh, continuation of this so we have basically just dilated on the uh, discussion we had yesterday about uh, the key risk factors okay so just to quickly recap what we have done so the, so now you understand why there is additional in, in addition to the points uh, the risk factors pointed out uh, yesterday on the currencies the yen and the aussie uh, you also have uh, an interest rate risk factor on this on the dollar loan because it's a floating rate loan which you can see from the case in the questions of the case you can see it's a floating rate loan that introduces interest rate risk okay so typically the way you would manage is now let's also try to briefly understand the uh, euro dollar futures contract because we will try to discuss it in the case if we have time our priority is going to be these contracts which we are actually going to use for trading all right so i hope you guys have already started uh, making yourself familiar with these movements what is going on in gold what's going on in copper if you go to the cme website you'll find a lot of fundamental information also the objective of this project is that as you are trading managing the hedge book you should learn about these instruments these are all very mainline commodities mainstream commodities so any knowledge you derive about the no any knowledge you pick up on the copper market or the gold market it's all very useful for your overall training okay so on the CME website, you'll find a lot of information about uh, these markets, fundamental and technical information. So you can train yourself uh, to, uh, you know, get familiar with form forming views on these markets. All right. And you can use this and you can use other charts also. I'll try to give you other charts. But this our friendly neighborhood charting system. This is quite versatile. It charts almost everything. OK. All right. OK so um we were discussing yeah let's go back to the euro dollar futures contract uh, you read up on the futures contract uh you have to make so the other the other objective of this project is that through the you uh, you have to make yourself familiar with the uh the specifications of these futures contracts so everything i can't spoon feed you everything in the class okay in the class i'm only covering the basic conceptual uh, aspects which you need to understand okay to uh, to be able to grasp what is going on but then you guys have to do a lot of reading outside the class you have to basically familiarize yourself with the contract specifications try to understand the products okay this is all new for you so the way the euro dollar futures works is why do you think this says 91 11 50 okay if you look at the uh, contract specs i'll just show you how to uh, where is our um 
I think I put that into the futures note. So let's open the futures note. I think I've put the futures also into your, into your. Uh, no, you already have that uh, in your. Uh, let's put that into the futures note. So we have the links here. We're going to open the. Uh, do you understand this problem? What are we trying to understand here? Can anyone explain what this means? 98.1150. Let's say it's 98.1150. The euro dollar futures. This is the rate for three month euro dollar futures expiring on December 16th, which means through this contract, you are betting on what the LIBOR fix will be on that date. Okay, maybe one or two days here and there. You have to read the settlement procedures, but around approximately around that date. So what are people? doing when they are using this futures contract they are using this futures contract to express their views on what the cash market uh, three month uh, euro dollar fix is going to be in London every day there's a London these are called fixings okay these rates that come out these are called fixings so if you ask somebody like show me the if somebody is asking you show me the euro dollar fixings three month euro dollar US dollar uh, US USD uh, show me the USD uh, euro dollar fixings that means he's, uh, he wants to know all the maturities for today what were the fixings so these rates that finally get published okay those rates are known as the fixings which you will see here you can see some delayed data these guys like every exchange they're trying to make money by selling their data okay so they will give you some data but they'll give you some delayed data you can find some links to uh, delayed data over here when you read I'm sure they'll give you some uh, they've given you the methodology as well all right so you'll find some delayed data so he's looking for that essentially so this can are you following what is going on in this contract you are supposed to use this futures contract to express your views on what the uh, on December 16th, what is going to be the cash market fixing for three month US dollar deposit, euro dollar deposits in, in London? Are you following? Yes. Okay. So, uh, what is going to be the euro dollar deposit fixing in London for three months? Okay. That That is what you are betting on using this futures contract. So, if you think this uh, futures contract, if the, if the level of the futures contract is too high relative to what you think will happen on, thir on, on, on December 16th, mm -hmm. then you will sell it and then otherwise you will buy it okay so that's how it works but why is it 98.1150 by now our uh, sh page should have opened so let's open this and understand what why this is so we're going to spend a little bit of time on the euro dollar futures contract since we started on the what happened what is the problem there's a sound coming from maybe this thing is on it's off and it's still coming okay all right can you understand this euro dollar contract this is one of the reasons why um, um, okay so this is it had to be on that's why it's making this noise okay guys now try to understand this okay what is the contract unit remember everywhere the uh, unit is being, being given and how is the contract being quoted so you'll see the price quotation part the contract unit is 2500 into this contract IMM index IMM is stands for IMM stands for international monetary market this is a very old division of the CME where the currency futures first started okay so this is uh, what IMM means so what is that so understand the contract unit is like in in the case of crude oil is a thousand barrels okay in the case of uh, copper it is some um, you know uh, two thousand we have to see what the copper spec is but uh, it's some pounds some amount of pounds okay 625 or something like that uh, so uh, here you see the contract units being defined this is the size of the contract one contract size okay just like in US equity options one contract size is 100 shares okay so here the size of the contract is 2500 into this index now what is this index the index is now defined as 100 minus R okay 100 minus R and so 100 minus is clear but what is R okay R is what look at this can you read it on the last bench you guys can read on the last bench no I made it even smaller now can you read now can you read okay now you can read now what is R try to understand this what is R because it says 100 minus R now try to understand we have, we have, what we are trying to understand here is 
why is this euro dollar futures contract now that you have a broad idea that the euro dollar futures contract is being used to bet on the future fixing that will occur in the cash market for deposits for euro dollar deposits in london for three month us dollars what is going to be the fixing that is what is going to be the rate that is fixed on that date on december 16th okay so we're not there yet so why is it showing as 98 11.5 surely that can't be the interest rate it can't be 98 percent okay so let's try and understand why this is showing this way now try to understand so the if the quote is 100 minus r okay so what is r now you can see typically how the settlement happens okay third wednesday of the contract month so this see let's see what the this december 16th must be wednesday is it a wednesday Monday yeah so they have the uh, for spot settlement okay so you'll take the rate on this day but that will apply for a deposit starting from here this is how the deposit mark just like the spot market in foreign exchange okay so you have the rate for this very period it will apply to a deposit which the interest rate will start accruing from here okay that's why you have the 16th to 18th all right okay um, so the rate the fixing will be done this uh, the fixing will be done on um, the 16th okay so now read this now try to understand why this r is whatever whatever is the three month rate okay so you're speculating here the three month rate is unknown you're speculating through this so what are you doing you're actually making you're expressing a forecast for the three month rate okay through the euro dollar futures price so if i think at this point of time if i think the euro dollar futures price is too high i will sell it if i think it's too low i'll buy it but too low too high relative to what relative to my forecast of what the fixing will be on 16 december okay so let's say now let's figure out what the market's forecast is at this point since the market price is 98.1150 okay we'll just take it as 50 all right we'll ignore the offer side uh if the market price is 98.1150 what does that mean okay let's go into one of your calc files maybe we can make a new um Okay, we can just do it in the futures um, uh, thing so it's 98 11 50 all right so if it is 98 um, notice one more thing it's 98 11 50 okay so it's 98 point 11 50 okay so this is it says that it's actually 100 minus r the contract so the r is the euro dollar rate okay so this has to mean that my forecast for the euro dollar futures contract is 100 minus 98 point thing that means this is my forecast are you following and not my forecast is the market's forecast okay are you following what this is okay so the market is forecasting at this point of time that the euro dollar fixing in london the cash market euro dollar fixing in london for three months uh, on december 16th is going to be 188.50 okay is this clear all right so if you think that the true value should be higher than this if you think the actual fi futures contract is going to be higher than this what will you do if it let's say if you think that actually the high the fixing is going to be 1.95 okay suppose you that's what you think okay that's your view uh, based on what you studied you look you went to fred you looked at the three month euro dollar deposit uh, chart and according to you the fixing on, on december 16 based on your view of the market is of this three month of this chart right based on you your view of this this is what we are forecasting can you see that yes. three month in uh, three month libor based on your view of three month libor you you think it's actually going to be fixed at 195 okay if it should be fixed at 195 according to you okay this is forecast based valuation once again we are doing a fair value calculation forecast based because it's based on nothing but my forecast all right so my forecast is 195 then the uh, true value should be the fair value of the futures contract actually is this is how you trade the euro dollar futures okay so you form a view you can see once again how this is very critical for interest rate management when you actually go into a corporate treasury okay and start managing floating rate risk one of the ways the cleanest ways to do it and the euro dollar futures trade for many many uh, months okay if you see here if you look at the quotes um where are our quotes contract specs okay they we put it like this if you look at the euro dollar futures quotes they trade for many many years they trade for years basically you'll see euro dollar contracts now look at the euro dollar contracts 
they are trading for many many uh, years actually you'll see so many and there are all kinds of market terminology can you see at 19 20 december 19 jan 20 feb 20 march 20 you're able to bet on what the fixing will be in each of these so in feb march 20 you're betting on 16th i mean two days before the third wednesday of the month because the 16th has come about because third wednesday of the month is the rule spot settlement of third day of the third wednesday of the month so you have to go two business days before that to see which day is fixing you're betting on are you following yes. third wednesday of the month in december is 18th so spot settlement two business days before is 16th so that means in the december contract you're betting on the 16 december fixing everyone is following yes okay ritesh you're following okay so similarly if you go to june 2020 third wednesday in june whatever it is two two business days before not two days two business days okay two business days before okay that's the fixing that you're betting on with the june 2020 contract when you're betting on this and how do you play this contract you form a view you go to this you look at the charts you form your fundamental views whatever it is maybe the federal reserve is going to cut rates or hike rates or whatever in between because remember u.s federal reserve rates will have a big impact on libor because the, the maturities are quite close together about overnight to 15 days and this is like uh, three months so not much difference okay so they'll be quite uh, strongly affect you take a view on the what the libor fixing is going to be okay you look at the market you find that the markets fair markets estimate of the uh, libor fixing is 188.50 but your view is that the actual fixing is going to be let's make it even more uh, egregious let's make it 2.15 let's say your forecast is that the LIBOR is going to be fixed at 2.15 according to you then the fair value of the of the futures contract again you see here you're doing fair forecast based valuation okay very simple crude model but you're doing forecast based valuation just like you do for stock valuation Gordon growth model etc same kind of model this is also a model right because there's a mathematical relationship okay between inputs and outputs so you have a forecast 2.15 based on the way this contract is calculated 100 minus 2.15 should be the fair value of the futures contract so you find the fair value of the futures contract according to you is 97.85 okay so now is the market overpriced or underpriced relative to fair value overpriced okay so when the market is overpriced when the market price is higher than fair value what do you do you sell okay so this is how you play uh, views on interest rate short term interest rates with euro dollar futures okay this is a very important so you, because this is part of our case discussion this actually we've already had our case discussion on uh, part of the discussion not the entire discussion because there are other ways to manage these risks okay which is uh, to look so you should start reading when you're talking about more discussion on managing risks you should read in your uh, in your folder you will find um, the in your case folder you'll find there's a technical note on swaps okay so on swaps or uh, basically on capital market swaps this is the one on swaps okay so on capital market swaps which is includes interest rate swaps currency swaps these are other ways of managing and in particular you can also manage this risk through interest rates uh, swaps by swapping into a fixed rate that discussion is also there in the in the other question in the case which is over here um, if you see when we come another discussion of interest rate swaps will come up because the treasurer the ceo wants to swap this loan into a floating rate okay this is another important question another decision problem should they do that just like you can go from floating to fix through interest rate swaps okay which we are not uh, we have not discussed i'm just giving you a, a preview i'm just saying that there is this there is this thing called a cow but you don't know what a cow is but i'm saying that there's something called a cow okay later on i'll show you what a cow is okay so it's like there's this thing called an interest rate swap okay so uh, you can use that to move from fixed to floating and you can use it to move from floating to fixed effectively we'll see those transactions when we discuss these questions in the case but the point is the other way there's that's one way of managing interest rate risk but another very clean way of managing interest rate risk against specific for specific floating rate fixes is like this by using in euro dollar futures is everyone clear what we have just discussed very important you have to understand how what the euro dollar futures contract is very important contract one of the most important interest rate short-term interest rate futures contract wise it's the most important contract in the world 
because the US dollar is the most dominant uh, currency, the most dominant capital market. So euro dollar, three month euro dollar futures, okay, interest rate futures. So uh, you understand now how the system works and you are able to connect it to all the theoretical frameworks you studied earlier, price compare price to fair value, same thing. And this is actually forecast based fair valuation. It's not CRA. There's no arbitrage here because you're taking a risk because you don't you think it's going to go up to the fixing is going to be you think that the fixing is going to be 2.15 who knows the fixing actually might end up being 1.75 no one knows okay so you're taking a risk there's no CRA going on here okay so there is no true arbitrage so it is forecast based valuation just like you have in stocks and projects and all that all right so is everyone clear now how the uh, the euro dollar futures contract works and how you play the euro dollar futures contract and this is one way so if you had say for instance if you had a loan that was coming up for repricing now, now put yourself in the shoes of the treasury manager and a corporate treasury manager if you had a floating rate loan on the co uh, corporate's books which is coming up up for repricing on 16 December this we have taken a very short term uh, uh, focus assume that there is not that much assume that actually 16 December is very far away okay because you can see how many contracts exist it just happens that I've called up the 15 this I have to show you your dollar futures I've, I've called up the 16 December contract okay but actually you can see from here you can see how far down you can go can you see that it goes on and on and on okay there's not much trading happening here but up to september 2022 you can see is already actively trading and this is not this is not even a market r because not even frankfurt and zurich have come in this is not even real markets when the markets actually come in you see the same page in new york time then you'll see all this stuff is all actively trading okay so you can see how far out it goes so you can have a very long-term interest rate uh, floating rate loan okay just like our five-year loan in this example and you could be selling futures contracts against each of these maturities to manage your risk but you'll have to take a view also in the first place you have to take a view if you're going to trade the march 2025 contract you have to go to the third wednesday of the month go back two business days okay and then that day's fixing is what you're predicting so you have to take a view on that day's fixing what will be the three month euro dollar fixing in london on that day for three month euro dollar interest rate uh, deposits okay what will be the interest rate fixing on march 2025 mm -hmm. and then you'll go through the same process that i showed you here okay that you will see that the market is scoring some price you can already see some price here okay maybe uh, that is not active it's unchanged but you can still see a price no there's no price given here okay whatever say you do it for september 2024 you see some price here yeah. this is the market's forecast that includes a market's forecast so 100 minus this is the market's forecast for what the fixing will be and then you form your own view and based on where you think the and then you'll figure out whether the uh, fair value whether the uh, futures contract contract relative to your view your estimate of fair value you followed what we did here yes. right I saw the markets price futures price that includes a forecast that implies a forecast for cash market fixing on December 16th okay and I form my own view on the fo forecast for cash market fixing okay I form my own forecast basically for the cash market fix so I come basically my forecast is for a higher LIBOR than what the market is forecasting and there and, and I compute the fair value of the futures contract if my forecast is correct forecast based valuation my fair value is lower than the market price so therefore I'm selling is everyone clear can you go through the entire are you able to follow the entire logic of uh, risk management here interest rate risk management through this contract okay so good so we've had this one discussion on uh, expanding on our um, discussion of of um, risk uh, key risk factors okay so we have now identified the key risk factors so let's quickly go through once again who's going to tell us uh, sg1 what are the key risk factors quickly on the so on the asset side okay okay so prices for market prices for gold copper and uh, uh, wti oil fine very good okay liability side uh, what are the key risk factors <laughs> <laughs> so dollar yen exchange rate we can just we, we will actually manage it
people by looking at the dollar yen because nobody really looks at the dollar yen <coughs> because when you're taking views on do on the dollar yen or the yen dollar market you usually look at it as a dollar yen chart that's what is the most actively traded segment of the market okay all right so uh, we will look at it as so here is the yen dollar or the dollar yen exchange rate whatever we'll just call it dollar yen exchange rate okay even though yen is the base currency in the futures contract and this is the Aussie US exchange rate okay and then the third risk factor is the three month euro dollar LIBOR okay three month euro dollar LIBOR interest rate okay these are the three risk factors on the liability side okay so we've uh, figured this out now so quickly to recap what have we done yesterday so yesterday we did we have covered risk books everyone be quiet don't I want to hear any talking there's some talking going on some noises are coming through okay so what are the just to quickly recap what we have followed please make sure you follow what is going on otherwise you will get totally lost okay uh, make sure you get some learning out of this case okay so this time we are spending on the case you should get some learning and you'll be able to understand many aspects of corporate treasury risk management and how it differs from running a speculators book how the running of a passive risk book differs from the running of an active risk book which you are already familiar with in your previous two projects okay so we have covered risk books okay and we covered what is the basic concept of a risk book what are the different types of risk books active and passive risk books you've seen that why do we call them passive because they don't want to speculate on prices of uh, particular commodities but by being in the business of mining and exploring those commodities they are forced to have some risk uh, they are forced to have some risk uh, to those commodity price exposure okay because they have to carry inventories so are you following this logic why it's called passive risk because they're not actively taking the risk but by on account of the business they are in they are exposed to those market risks okay yes okay so risk books and the types of risk books and then we have covered key, key risk factors okay right any doubts so far okay so let's go on to the next question the next part topic that we have to understand is the question that is being asked by the CEO is so key risk factors when we come to key risk factors I have to understand one more thing that this is a very important way uh, this is a very important skill to be able to identify it's not very complicated to be able to identify the risk factors because whether even when you're like you've heard of this designation called risk manager okay in many situations you have a risk manager designation whether it's in a corporate treasury setting or it's in a um, uh, in the actively tra active risk books the speculator side okay on the market making desk or on a directional <coughs> speculation desk okay and asset management houses or in ba on bank trading flows the one designation a risk manager so one of the first things that you will do as a risk manager is the one of the key tasks is to identify the key risk factors because these are like the sources of risk are you able to follow what I'm saying by sources of risk what I mean by sources of risk that this this is a risk book okay and what is causing this to be a risk book this particular prices that move around so these are like the sources of risk okay if I had just had some fixed assets plant okay just some building buildings those are not sources of risk those are not sources of market risk on this book because the price of the building is not going to fluctuate from minute to minute yes okay so these key risk factors are the sources of risk so one of the first things that you have to do whether you're managing this case is a discussion of a passive risk book okay but even if you are a risk manager on a bank trading floor managing foreign exchange risk or managing interest rate risk okay uh, even then one of the first things you'll have to do once you understand what books you are responsible for the first thing you have to do is look at the book and see and identify what are the key risk factors okay identify what are the key risk factors and in this case we have given all spot based key risk factors but you could also be managing an FX options book in which case you will have uh, you know uh, additional risk factors like the eyeballs <laughs> because the eyeballs moving around will affect the prices of risk uh, uh, of options okay so the first point is that this this activity of act identifying the risk factors is one of the first uh, things you have to do as a risk manager so now you understand what needs to be where you need to keep an eye on where, what you need to keep an eye on all right okay so we have covered these now we go on to our next question which is the CEO is asking what are the underlying positions okay now underlying position here when we talk about I just write the small clarification in your running notes okay so some of the notes will be in your running notes which is um, so I think this is already covered in your general notes 
let me put this down here okay uh, let's go to your general note on uh, yeah okay so let's go back to underlying position okay we can just look at underlying position underlying exposure okay so position and exposure we are using interchangeably okay if we say an uh, air india has a position in crude oil it's the same as saying that air india is exposed to the prices of crude oil the meaning of being exposed means it's a sense like if you have a house with a balcony which is not covered so the balcony we'd say is exposed to the elements okay rain can come and fall all kinds of stuff can fall so it's exposed so air india is exposed to crude oil prices movement of crude oil prices it may go in their favor or against you so position and exposure we use kind of interchangeably okay so we have the so just read a little bit about this okay and these guys don't understand that i'm using underlying okay so the keywords here let me highlight the keywords they'll help you to understand okay so the first thing you notice that underlying positions okay so i'm very careful over the use of words so if i say underlying position that means it's a type of position okay so if i say bba student that means it's a type of student okay so position positions can be what type what are the two possible types of positions long, long and short okay so that means the underlying position if i ask you this question that the senior is asking what are the underlying positions for each key risk factor okay the answer can be only either long or short it can't be like blue black gray okay so it's either long or short so but you have to figure out which one that is okay so it's underlying this is always discussed with respect to a market okay in fact we should write this as always whenever we say market because you never see a market in isolation it's always a market instrument combination okay you understand what I mean by this that what is this what is this this is dollar yen prices yes but that's not sufficient that you're not giving all the information that you could these are spot dollar yen prices are you following okay so these are dollar yen prices these are spot dollar yen prices so now you are giving a market instrument combination okay if you remember when we discussed markets initially I, I i said to you that you never see a market price of any uh, uh, in any market you'll never see a market price that is disconnected from an instrument so when you're seeing a market price of some of uh, you know of some market price it is always some market instrument combination that is if you are seeing a dollar yen price this is well people will loosely say it's the dollar yen price but actually what it what they should be saying is that it's a spot dollar yen price How do you not spot? because well because i've given the ticker to make sure that it's spot <laughs> because it's not futures or forwards and on this platform you don't get forward prices okay but the point is that this is the spot price if you can see here this is the futures price yes. because this maturity today is what 6th of december yes, and so today if you do a foreign exchange deal that will settle on tuesday which is still not 16th of december okay and if you see we can actually look at futures prices uh when we can look at uh you know for much for further forward uh prices for futures uh for for yen futures and in particular especially for the commodity futures okay so the point to emphasize here is that this is a uh, uh this is a spot price okay and these are futures prices right if you remember this we had discussed this is also an important point to understand that you never see a market price that is disconnected from the concept of an instrument whenever you see a price it's always the price for a market instrument combination are you following if you see like you're seeing here you're seeing yen spot dollar yen prices you're seeing spot aussie prices okay you're seeing spot euro prices spot cable prices all right uh but and this so this any price always is the price for a particular market for some type of instrument there's no concept of price which does not include the idea of some instrument are you following this simple idea that we have to understand so whenever we write markets okay actually we what we should be writing is market instrument combination you can also get a price of dollar yen value cash okay you can get that price also but that is the ca uh, uh, the price of dollar yen value cash this is the price of dollar yen value spot 
okay this if you invert this this you if you want to see it like this you invert this and you'll get the prices of dollar yen for value 16th December okay but actually spot uh, uh, two days out of two two days uh, away from 16 December okay this is clear all right so this important idea we had already discussed earlier but you need to reinforce that that whenever there so that's why when I'm writing this concept here I should write it I had written it only as a market but actually whenever we say market what we really should be saying is market instrument combination everyone understand this language now okay because it's dollar yen spot dollar yen futures so it's a market and instrument market is dollar yen because there are two assets US dollar and Japanese yen and it's an instrument because it's either options or the spot or its futures or value cash or forwards or whatever okay so there's no concept of price delinked from the price concept of an instrument okay all right so it refers to the type of exposure will be long or short that we have already understood okay that an entity will have okay so we are always discussing the entity's underlying position what is Norway's underlying position with respect to crude oil okay so that will be the uh, what is the answer to that what is Norway's underlying position with respect to crude oil? Yes, what is it? Any answer? Norway, you know what Norway is? <laughs> so, what is Norway's underlying position with respect to crude oil? Okay, we'll discuss that. Okay, I'm just giving. So, the point I'm trying to emphasize here is only this. That that what is underlying position it is obviously type of position so it's long or short okay it is always discussed with respect to some market instrument combination okay so i will I'll ask you what is not an underlying position with respect to crude oil let's say i just mean spot crude oil okay or it could be i could but ide ideally i should say with respect to spot crude oil okay so i should always mention a market instrument combination so it's a type of position that is clear all right because you see it from the long position long or short okay right now so passive risk book this idea is already there now let's understand okay now this logic is all given in your books but in your notes okay but let's understand the logic let's play with this for a while okay before we look at the answers look at the technique okay let's play with this for a while let's forget about Norway now let's ask ourselves what is magma's magma's exposure with respect to okay let's let's maybe we should do Norway once so Norway is an exporter of oil or importer of oil Exporter. exporter of oil okay so very big exporter of oil so uh, now my question is what is Norway's underlying position with respect to crude oil future uh, say crude oil spot crude oil long who said long mayhak okay so why give her the mic give her the mic is the question clear we are now trying to understand because remember one of the questions in the case one of the questions in the case is the treasure the CEO wants to know what for each KRF identify we've already identified the KRFs now the CR, CEO wants to know for each KRF what is my underlying position is it long is it short that also we need to be clear about right we can't say it's just either long or short okay so um, now we are asking this question but to play with that idea to understand the concept of underlying position we are asking you this question of what is Norway's underlying position with respect to spot crude oil Mayak says it's long why <laughs> No, I always I have been continuously saying oil, no, not no, they have mayo. Yeah. Since they are exporting oil, so uh, that's why they are selling it. So. To other countries, so. Uh, so it's long. Okay. All right. Anybody else has a bit uh, different explanation? Short. Short. Your answer is short. Okay. Why is it short? Okay, guys, please pay attention here. What is Tarun's answer? Tarun is saying it's short. Yeah. Norway's underlying position with respect to crude oil, spot crude oil. Okay, we'll just say crude oil. I don't want to keep saying spot all the time. All right, so you're saying it's short. Why is it short? So because they are the producer. You agree with the view that Norway is a net exporter of crude oil? Yeah. Okay, fine. Then go on. Why is it short? Okay, quiet, quiet. Be quiet. Yes. As they are One minute. So they will sell the crude oil. Okay. And not buy. Okay. So, uh, it gives us a short position. Okay. And now, based on your convincing answer, Beha can also change her view. So you change your view. 
short. Have you changed your view? No, sorry, but I got confused within the term of long and short. How can you be confused about long and short as a finance student in the third term, in the third course of the year? You don't know what is long and short. But so long and short is the... Uh, One minute, guys. Be quiet. So, yes, Mohek, well, now let's clear that confusion if he has any confusion. Do you have any confusion about long and short? <coughs> what is the technical definition of long? No, if you go back to your notes and see, uh, technical definition initially. The price of what? That's not the term we use. What are the two terms we use for the market, for a, to, two assets in a market? Asset, yes. So now can tell me once again, what is the technical definition of long? <laughs> yeah, so complete your sentence. So I can complete Pulkit's sentence. What he's, he's got the concept right. The correct definition, which is includes all scenarios, is uh, long means you have taken a position through, uh, through which you are betting <coughs> that the price of the base asset will depreciate, uh, will appreciate okay in terms of the terms asset that the base asset will appreciate and the terms asset will depreciate your position the such position is such that it is reflects a, a view that the uh, base asset will appreciate and the terms asset will depreciate long definition but it is very important to understand this shows that your concepts is concept is clear because for everything we don't have any kind of loose definitions okay we have everything is very tightly defined are you able to follow that the definitions are very tight very precise what does it mean that it means that you are with respect to the base asset Asset, you are making a bet that it will go up the price of the base asset will go up and the terms asset will depreciate is it clear to everyone that is the long definition of long position now mehak is clear yes. okay now go back to your point uh, bharat is also adding to your view what is so, your what is your answer so my answer is they are going long but they are not going we are not asked they are not going anywhere yeah, we are asking long. what is the position yeah their position is long net position I is long they are the exporter of you agree with the first view that the they, they are net they exporters, are exporters. Yes. okay okay my, i think they are exporters of the product so they want to sell their product on a, a particular level of the price okay if they are going short that means the market price is they are not high. going anywhere they are what is if the current they, situation if their position is short yeah then their view is that the price will fall in the future okay the okay but if the main exporter of the particular product is uh, has a view that the price is fall then the consumer will also are not ready to uh, pay high prices for their product okay so fine so 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 your so i'll just uh, stop the discussion anybody else wants to say anything at this point so i'll just because we want to save time also otherwise this is one of the problems of interactive uh, discussions right that we spend a lot of time but it's good but bharat is the closest to the answer okay that uh, the are the right answer is they are long now try to understand what the logic is okay how will you figure out so first you have to have some contextual knowledge so if i ask you now what is saudi aramco's underlying position saudi aramco is also a net exporter okay there are their exposure is going to be long so let's take the example of saudi aramco they are also like norway on the same side okay now why is it uh, now why do we say that they are long okay so now let's understand now that you have the context you need some contextual knowledge you need to know that norway is a net exporter that aramco is a, a saudi saudi arabia is a net exporter okay so now that you have the contextual knowledge if the oil price goes up does saudi arabia make money or lose money they make money they're making money relative to the current market okay yes everyone agrees okay now if the oil price goes down what happens to saudi are they making money or losing money they're losing money okay now go back to long and short what do you understand of long and short okay now between long and short which of the positions has this kind of characteristic no. that if the market goes up I make money no. and if the market goes down I lose money is my question clear yes. make sure you understand the logic don't memorize anything we are trying to understand whether what is Saudi Arabia's position with respect to crude oil we're trying to learn the logic of how to understand the underlying position for any entity it requires some contextual knowledge that Saudi Arabia is a net exporter that much you have to know all right so given that now we ask ourselves is the oil price goes up for any market so in this case we are discussing oil if the oil price goes up we see that they make money then if it goes down we see that they lose money then we come back and based on our knowledge of long and short we ask ourselves okay between long and short which type of position has this kind of characteristic that if the market goes up you make money and if the market goes down you lose money 
Which one is it? Long. Long position behaves like that, right? Long position will have this kind of property. Similarly, you can flip it around. If you look at now, let's talk about India. Okay, what is India's uh, position? This uh, position with respect to spot crude oil? Yes, who will tell us? Aurora, what is India's position with respect to uh, spot crude oil? Short. Short. Why? We'll give him the mic. Give him the mic. Everyone followed the logic I gave you. You're not supposed to memorize anything. You should understand the logic. Okay? Because the logic is fairly common sense logic. Okay, one minute. Now we are quiet. Now let Aurora answer. Why? Sir, when price goes up, uh, we lose money. Okay. And when price goes down, we make money. Okay. And? Complete the answer. I am like a computer. I don't understand anything. I am not able to follow your answer. You have to complete everything logically like you are talking to a baby or a computer which doesn't understand anything. Otherwise your answer is not complete. You have to get into the habit of giving complete answers. Yeah. What is the completion of the answer? So what does that mean? So why should it be short? Now second part of your answer. Okay, so the second part of his answer should have been that he has given the first part correctly. So it is only a short position that behaves in this manner. The long position does not have these characteristics. Only a short position has these characteristics that when the market goes down, you make money. And when the market goes up, you lose money. That was the second part of your answer. So you have to get into the habit of giving answers like you're talking to a computer. Everything has to be spelt out from the very beginning to the very end. Uh, that forces you to think in a very logical manner because many times we human beings have a tendency to skip through oh, that is very obvious it's obvious to human beings but it's not obvious to computers so when you're teaching yourself some con uh, concepts you should always force yourself to think in this manner it will clear it will strengthen your thinking processes okay so is everyone clear now now you understand yeah that will come to later that you're going far ahead now let's first understand we have to first make sure that the underlying position is clearly understood is this clear we have not gone to hedge position yet okay so underlying position is a type of position now we have to be able to figure out with some contextual knowledge what is a given entity's exposure what is a given entity's underlying position with respect to any market instrument combination is this clear we've gone through the exercise anybody has any doubts now everyone is clear Kaneka you followed the logic yeah okay all right okay so now let's go through to our case and quickly go through the underlying yes Tarun what is it yeah all right okay now we are going to start from the very beginning so we what is magma resources what is their underlying position with respect to gold magma we'll just call it magma what is magma now we are going back to the case so what is magma's underlying position with respect to gold give her the mic because she'll have to give an explanation also whatever her answer is yeah one minute we have to go around everybody and ask people yes one minute guys please be quiet be quiet i need to listen to the answer yes the answer is gold is long why so because it is on the asset side. Okay. And uh, <coughs> yes. It has been such twenty five hundred, which is which is. The units is not relevant to your answer. As long as it's more than more than zero. If it is more than zero, then it, uh, there is some risk. Okay. So, uh, yes, you are not able to complete your answer. You are saying it is long. Yeah, I knew this part that it is long because it is on the asset side and as well. Yes. Quick, Bon Vita quiz contest. We have to move on. Okay, let's give it to Mehak. 
Yes. So they have a long position because uh, if the market is going up, I will make money. If the market is going down, I lose money. So uh, according to this, uh, since it's a uh, mining company, so uh, it will be a long position. Okay, so second part could have been a little bit better. You should have talked about the the fact that it is only a long position that behaves like this. Okay, so you started off well by saying that by noting that it's on the asset side. Okay, so these are inventories. So that means they have that the, if the prices go up, they will make money. If the prices go down, they will lose money. Okay, so then the second part of the answer should have been that it is only a long position that has these characteristics and not a short position. Is this clear to everyone? Okay, so quickly we'll go through quickly now to save time uh, next what is the position in copper underlying position magma's underlying position with respect to copper Anjum yes don't murmur tell us give her the mic uh, we maybe we don't have time for the mic okay Vimma. underlying position is long Yes, sir, okay. because it's an asset side and uh, base asset is going up and... What is the base asset in this market? No, you're not confident. Copper is the base asset, but you're not saying it confidently. <coughs> Copper is the base asset and what is the term's asset? US dollars. US dollars, okay. So you have to be more confident. So copper is so and so therefore if the price goes up they'll make money and the price goes up same logic. If the price goes down they'll lose money. Alright, same same for you oil. I'm not repeating that. Okay. So make sure you understand everything, every step. Yes, are you following? Okay. <laughs> Uh, okay next is now okay this is a little more complicated okay uh, now we are going to what we are going to do is that we are going to discuss al although the uh, in this case the loan is in yen terms okay and the contract that you're trading is going to be the yen futures contract which is inverted okay which is yen as base asset dollar as terms asset but to make your life more complicated and to make it more realistic because nobody in the world actually takes views on this kind of yen dollar exchange rate everybody looks at this rate okay so i'm going to make you trade and make you think of the exposure in terms of dollar yen and then you will be taking your hedge decisions you'll be ex executing your hedges in a yen futures contract so that'll be more complicated so that'll be a better test for you guys there'll be better training for you guys are you following what i'm saying yes, yes. that we are not going to think of our dollar yen views in terms of this yes. uh, inverted rate because nobody does that okay so the dollar yen the main active market for dollar yen is in spot that's where the liquidity is so you will form your views based on dollar yen all right and now so this we have to understand clearly so is this clear the first step although the loan is in yen terms the yen futures contracts have yen as the base asset as far as our view taking on we have already identified the dollar yen exchange rate as a key risk factor we've already identified that which means you have to have a view on that essentially we are coming to that when you put on your hedge positions everything has to be based on a that's why i've told you to start tracking these markets okay because you have to get into the habit of forming a view on these markets now we have to form a view on the dollar yen that's how we're going to proceed we're going to form a view on the dollar yen and if we want to buy the dollar yen okay if you are going to buy the dollar yen if you feel bullish on this chart okay so it's going to be more complicated you're going to if you feel bullish on this chart you will be you would have ordinarily bought dollar yen but you don't get to trade in spot dollar yen you have to trade yen futures so if you were buying dollar yen you would have been selling yen mm -hmm. so then you will go let's say you form a bullish view on this chart that is your bullish on dollar yen mm -hmm. okay and then you will go and that means you're bearish on the yen if you're bullish on dollar yen that means you're bullish on the yen uh, bearish on the yen is everyone following this so if you're bearish on the yen here this is the only contract you're allowed to trade okay so you will now go and sell this contract this is clear yes all right okay so this is how it's going to work because this is how normally you would you should do it so it's going to introduce an additional level of complexity into your hedge book management which is good more complexity is better because it forces you to uh, it puts you in a more difficult situation so your training is better yes okay all right so let's quickly take a uh, take a view on this now tell us what is the uh, underlying exposure of uh, we are going to talk in terms of dollar yen so what is magma's underlying position with respect to dollar yen 
you want to look at the balance sheet i think we should look at the balance sheet so what is magma's question is clear underlying position everyone has understood what is magma's underlying position with respect to dollar yen short okay verma let's give verma a chance verma what is your answer the long long okay all right so let's test this quickly on the balance sheet okay if verma is correct if verma is correct okay then what should happen if if the dollar yen rates verma is saying the underlying exposure with respect underlying position with respect to dollar yen is long okay you are saying it's short okay so let's see if verma is correct okay let's first see if verma is correct one minute guys be clear one sec follow this logic please if verma is correct then he's saying that we are underlying position is long if he is correct when the dollar yen rate drops that means if i make it 105 for example yes. it should show a loss yes. because he's saying the underlying position is long so then when the market drops he should show a loss mm -hmm. and when the market goes up he should show a profit okay which means what's going to happen total assets and li liabilities will not change balance sheet size will not change but watch the uh, we don't have a do we have a subtotal for some but you watch the dollar dollar value you watch this cell dollar value of the yen loan okay and the uh, net worth okay because what is going to happen if Burma is right and we re re change this rate to 105 okay then the this figure will go up and this figure will go down because total assets is not changing total liability so what is happening outside liabilities is growing up bigger so net worth has to shrink yes. because total liabilities are not changing so outside liabilities are growing bigger because the dollar value of the yen loan is growing bigger yes are you following what i'm saying <laughs> and therefore to accommodate that the net worth has to shrink because the total cannot change a plus b is equals k k cannot change if a is now increasing then b has to decrease yes okay so let's do it let's see if verma is correct we are going to change it to 105 yes verma is correct yes sir yes sir we can change it even lower we can make it like 101 or 2 yes sir now you can see net worth used to be 2 million something yes now it's come down to 109 okay and uh, market value has also gone up it was two something i think it has gone up beyond two okay why did this happen let's quickly understand okay your time is up so i won't hold we'll continue in the next class but please make sure you try to understand this on your own then i'll explain it once again in the class but if you don't understand on your own this is a slightly more complicated example okay so uh, make sure you understand it on your own you can see this okay yes that market value closes. Market value? Which closes? This one. Oh, frozen. Okay. Frozen means? It only means that the value of gold and the loan value they are same. No, no, no. Market value frozen means that when you start the project, okay, I will freeze the market values on the start date of the project because I need to figure out because the way you will be you will be evaluated is what was your starting net worth because unless I freeze the market values I can't freeze your net worth I need to freeze your net worth and capture the starting net worth okay and then I will see at the end of the project let's say after three weeks or four weeks or whatever okay because you uh, maybe you won't have more than four to five weeks so after five weeks obviously these prices will change then I'll once again compute the balance sheet with the five week later prices there will be a, some different net worth okay so that net worth may be lower than the starting or the higher than the starting net worth but it could be either if it is lower than the starting net worth 
that means your underlying positions have lost value okay on a net basis and if it's higher than the underlying position it may matter but in the meantime you are also running a separate hedge book which you can't see here so you are running a hedge book here by trading in all these futures contracts right so when you are running a hedge book here your goal is to make sure that you offset the losses in the underlying position that's the question that Shristi was asking that how does the hedge position work which is anticipating what we are going to cover in the future that so this objective here is to that's why you have to take a view like for instance as we have established you are long dollar yen okay we have established that you're long dollar yen so if you feel that the dollar yen is going to drop that means the yen is going to appreciate okay so you're worried about this this will affect your underlying position losses it will increase your losses so what you're going to do is if the yen is likely to rise in value you will go in and you will buy these yen futures contracts yes so that now you're doing all this buying all this trading in the TWS will happen in your hedge book so you have the hedge positions and the underlying positions underlying positions you don't touch but you watch them you see what the KRFs are you watch the KRFs of markets you take a view if you see now you see the dollar yen as a KRF you feel that the euro your underlying position is long so now if you feel that the dollar yen is likely to go down based on your view so the yen is likely to appreciate so you're going to lose money on the underlying position so to offset that you will buy yen futures contracts on the hedge book on the hedge book so the losses on the underlying position in the yen future future uh, on the dollar yen loan okay the yen loan those will be offset by the profits you make on your hedge position are you following yes, that's why we have the concept of total position total position equals underlying position plus hedge position so we will look at your total profit based on PNL on underlying PNL on hedge position so if your view is correct in this case you will not lose any money on a net basis because all the losses on the underlying position will be make up made up on the profits on the hedge position is this clear this is the logic of hedging okay. Okay, one minute. she's waiting for let's give her let's follow a queue you have a queue number <laughs> okay yes when you ask a normal question should we answer that the the position will depend on the value of crude oil in international market if it's there if we no 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 position does not depend on that the assessment of the underlying position is not uh, not dependent on the uh, value of crude oil if it's depreciating won't we say it will be uh, now crude oil would be short no no they no. think that they have to make the profit no 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 you have not understood the you have not understood the um, logic of the underlying position see if norway is a net exporter of crude oil okay so they are just like magma in the sense that they are, have to carry some inventories they are like a producer of crude oil so everybody has some inventory they have reserves underground those reserves also have to be valued there's a valuation of reserves also right <laughs> so the, all that is connected to the market price of crude oil so so all of norway's not all of their assets but a significant chunk of their assets are in crude oil okay in whatever form okay either underground or on, uh, already uh, packed into barrels okay so a significant chunk of their assets is in crude oil so the exposure is long because all those assets their value will drop if the market price of crude oil drops yes just imagine here the same thing it's just like see imagine this is norway imagine this is norway they have some inventory of crude oil some underground reserves of crude oil everything is valued based on the market price of crude oil all right so if we make this drop one minute let me just do two control control z right i want to take it back to the original price yeah that was the original price so i will lose track of that so if i now drop this price from 57.93 to let's say forty dollars. Okay, what will happen? The dollar value of this will drop. Yes, sir. Okay, total balance sheet will uh, will collapse. So they, should, they should buy. They should be short of the. They should be short of the. So they have. Then they have to. That make you are also doing the same thing as Tanya. You are going far far ahead into the hedging hedging strategy. We are now trying to understand only the underlying position. Don't go ahead a few steps right now. So Try to understand the underlying position. Form on the basis of the uh, view we have only. No, no. One minute, but we are. It's an underlying position.
position, which means what is the natural position that they have on account of the way they are as an exporter or under, uh, just wait, maybe once, once we explain hedge position, you understand. Yeah, so, so, so then they are coming under the position, they want to take in account the market, they want to they want look at the chart, oil chart. Yes. No, no, they also have to look at the oil chart, if they're to the extent because that they are doing any the hedging. They will form the opinion that the uh, oil, is oil is appreciating or depreciating, mm -hmm. so, and, uh, for, and on the basis of that they will form their opinion. So that's why I say that if the oil, oil is depreciating, so they will, they, they will have short, they will be short on the oil. That's what I'm saying. You are going ahead to the hedging strategy. We are not going. We haven't gone there yet. At this point, what is the question we were discussing? The, uh, we are only discussing the question about the underlying position. We have not yet finished. We have not yet finished our discussion. What we are trying to do at this stage, when we have to end the class, is we are going to each key risk factor and we are asking ourselves, what is the underlying position? Which means, what is the natural position? What is the natural position with respect to crude oil, with respect to copper, with respect to dollar yen, with respect to the Aussie? Are you following? Okay, sir, if we continue to be long on oil, so, so won't that be a, um, I think it would be bad for them. No, no, I think what you do is just pay. Are they oil, uh, uh, oil exporter? They are not exporting, they are just buying and buying. So No, they are not buying. One minute. You are again making okay, the same mistake. Like same mistake yeah, that Bharat yeah. was making. Okay, he was not making a mistake, okay. but he was using the wrong words. Okay, okay. He was saying they are going to do yeah, it. They have, they have, they have. We are not talking about they have done. We are not talking about anything they are doing. We are saying as we look at Norway, as they are standing still, not moving. What are they? Long on crude oil or the short crude oil? The answer is they are long crude oil because if the price of crude oil drops, they will make a loss because all their reserves, all their inventories will be revalued lower to a lower level. Are you following? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So the underlying, so think of it as a natural position. Underlying position is like a natural position. So later on when we discuss hedge position, then you are, you are going farther, far no, ahead. Of them buying, they buy. No, you are going far ahead into what they should do. That we have not gone there yet. We are only discussing what are the underlying positions. What's the point? You are getting confused because you are going further ahead. So at this stage, we are trying to understand what is their natural position. That's all. Nothing else. Yeah. Clear. Okay. Once we have. Yeah. Okay. What is yours? Not related to this, but related to net. Then any technical question? Okay. Yeah. So tell me how that we can also record. I have read that SEBI has to uh, change the payment uh, in sport market. We have, we can uh, the transaction should be in two business days. Okay. So now SEBI has changed to one day because of the car week issue. Yeah. So that won't be considered as term because you said in term. Yeah, but there are some exceptions already. So good question. So the the general uh, idea behind the spot is two business days beyond the transaction. Action day, okay, the settlement. But there are already some exceptions, like in the foreign exchange markets. When you look at US dollar Canada, okay, if you look at US dollar Canada exchange rate, that rate, when you trade dollar Canada, that settlement is one day later. Although you're you still call it spot dollar Canada, okay, that is one day later. So usually it is there are some countries where India was anyway planning to move shorter and shorter to settlement. So some countries have T plus three also. So it it kind of fluctuates around T plus. Two. You remember T plus two, T plus zero. So in generally, most of it is T plus two on spot. But in some, as I told you, in the dollar Canada exchange rate, spot dollar Canada, that value actually is T plus one. Okay, because of the convention, because there is no need to give them so much time because New York and Toronto are all in the same time zone, right? They're in the same time zone, so it's not like New York and Tokyo or something. So you have to give them time. They have already closed by the time these guys. Are. So that that anomaly is already there so it is kind of you know, the way to think about spot is mostly it is t plus two but there can be some exceptions okay so they will still call this spot spot uh, equity trading they are just trying to reduce the settlement period which they were anyway planning to do from before they had that idea so they don't use tom term no they will not say tom tom is generally a term that is used mostly mostly in the foreign exchange markets but technically you can use it for any transaction which is valued tomorrow but here we will i guess we will continue to call it spot 
Okay. So, so in, in, in a, if you want to think about these settlement periods in a more uh, sort of robust way, which is not affected by these kind of rule changes and nomenclature, the best way to think about it is T plus 0, T plus 1, T plus 2, T. So you ask the market, what is it? What is your settlement? Is it T plus 1, T plus 7, T plus 1, T plus 3? What is it? So that is a better way to go about it because then you avoid these nomenclatures like these words like spot, which can have different meanings like spot dollar yen is t plus two but spot dollar canada is t plus one so there is a little bit of a confusion so the other way to think about the spot is that spot is roughly around t plus two most of the market spot markets will be t plus two but there are some exceptions that's it like yeah so uh, when we discuss the currency i had this out watch my battery one minute but my battery does down so uh, 24 yeah okay I had this, this out. Some currency a dual currency model. They have their home currency and they also have the foreign currency, which is which is uh, I think they are they allowed this in the you know, the Western markets. So I think Zimbabwe has Zimbabwe dollar also, South 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 well. So those are both fiat currency regimes. Fiat only means that uh, it's just that the Nepalese government is is accepting Indian rupees as payment. So, like in most countries when you go, if you are paying in US dollar cash, no one will say no. You go to Indonesia and you can pay in US dollar cash, including Indonesian rupiah. Okay? Uh, so because US dollar cash, everybody wants to have US dollars. So it's freely convertible. Okay? And so it's just both are fiat currencies. Okay, so in, in Nepal, when you are using uh, Indian rupees, it does not change the fact that in the Indian rupee is a fiat currency. The fiat comes from the word uh, fiat is like an order of a sovereign or a person with a very uh, author a body with a lot of authority. Okay, so it's like a fatwa. Okay, so fiat is that. That's what fiat means. Okay, so fiat means essentially so that this is the why is this piece of paper that we have two thousand rupees? We have a piece of paper, and you are saying it's two thousand rupees. Why? Because RBI says it's 2,000 rupees. Okay. It's not like there's gold worth of 2,000 rupees. If one currency is strong and another, our currency, if a foreign currency is strong and domestic currency, so don't you think it will create an instability within the economy? No, no I don't understand the first part of the question. Sir, if, uh, if, uh, we are, if India allows, sorry, Nepal allows uh, both currency in the domestic market, and India, suppose, supposing that Indian, Indian, Indian currency is strong and Nepali currency is weak, so don't you think it will create a kind of instability? No, there's no instability as such because there will be an exchange rate also between these two currencies, right? There will be money changes in Nepal who are changing Indian rupees into Nepalese, uh, Nepali rupees. So there's always an exchange rate. That's why you have a foreign exchange market. There is, you have all this, you can see all this movement in the dollar yen. Is it creating instability? You saw this movement in dollar yen, okay? It will create instability when we have too much of dollars in our... It's not instability, it's instability. Instability? Yeah. Say, if it will be the environment become instable when we have too much of dollar in our hand, in within our domestic world. Why should it be unstable? There's no difference. As long as you have a free foreign exchange market, okay? Here you see the dollar yen moving up and down. The exchange rate is moving up and down. So where is the instability? It's, it's an international market. No, no, within the domestic boundaries. No, even within domestic markets. Why is there? There's a, as long as you have an exchange rate. What is the problem? You want to pay with suppose the dollar rupee exchange rate. Let's assume that it's, it's, if we say this by force, we say it's one. Then in that case, if something is worth like if I'm selling you a T-shirt worth 500 rupees, I don't really care whether you're paying in rupees or in dollars. If it is, let's say, two, that means if I have a rupee, if I have something priced at 500 rupees, you can pay me 250 dollars and I'll accept that. So as long as there's an exchange rate, what is the problem? There's no exchange. Two currencies are accepted as legal tender. 
right? So in currencies in countries which are freely which have freely convertible currencies, generally people don't bother with the foreign currencies because many people may not accept it. But in general, there is no problem because you have if you have a freely functioning foreign exchange market where you can exchange one for the other, then there's no problem. But in most countries, there's usually only one dominant currency, and then some other currencies may be accepted. But there's no instability. If you have a free market, there's no instability. They, actually, you can say that this is the fact that it is moving. <laughs> the fact that it is not a constant state line. Okay. The fact that it is moving, you can say, you can always say this is uh, proof of instability. Yeah, there is volatility because there is some change. But that is what the, the market, the point about the free markets is that by allowing the foreign exchange rate to fluctuate, you are able to accommodate other economic uh, forces. Like if a country has like what is happening in China, they are facing problems with the tariffs in the US. So what they're doing is they're depreciating the currency so that they don't have to raise prices to US um, you know, buyers. Because the US buyer might object if you raise the price to him. So what they're doing is basically they're depreciating the currency so that the US buyer is able to get more goods for the same dollar. For per each to for each dollar value of Chinese goods that they're getting is is more okay so therefore they're accommodating them in that way so the exchange rate is a way of uh, adjusting it's like a safety valve like you know pressure cooker you have a safety valve which lets out the pressure so the exchange rate is like a safety valve okay so when there is some kind of macroeconomic uh, disturbance the exchange rate can adjust to reflect that you know, disturbance that is why you should have free markets because otherwise what is happening is you're like uh, you're not allowing the forces to play freely it's like you're trying to keep a you know inflatable you have a life vest and you force it try to go make it go under water but then it comes out on the other side so it's artificial it's not unnatural is this clear yeah so only you still have a question okay Okay. <laughs> <laughs>